Trez and Lisieux is fascinating in so many ways. Hi, my name is Father Mike Schmitz, and this is Ascension Presents. So, ah, <laughs> I was recently reflecting on this young girl. She had her feast day a couple days ago, October 1st. Her name is St. Therese of Lisieux. The day before the Feast of St. Therese in the Catholic Church, we also have the Feast of St. Jerome. So, I think September 30th is St. Jerome, Doctor of the Church. Like, one of the greatest minds the Church has ever known. I think St. Augustine said about, who is one of the geniuses, right? St. Augustine said about St. Jerome that he, if, if Jerome doesn't know it, no one in the world knows it. <laughs> that kind of a thing. So, massive mind, hugely influential, gave us the translation of the, the Bible from Greek and Hebrew into Latin so that people could understand it and read it, um, hear it, and get it. So good. The next day is the feast of this girl, St. Therese, who um, is also a doctor of the Church. <laughs> But it boggles the mind, in so many ways, why she is a doctor of the church. Because St. Jerome makes sense. St. Jerome, yeah, translate the Bible, teach all these things that, you know, in the, in the fourth century that no one knew, uh, that people are just trying to, still trying to figure out about God and about Jesus and all these things. That makes sense. Doctor of the church. St. Therese, she entered the convent when she was 15 years old and she died when she was 24 years old. She heard the nuns outside her window of where she was dying saying that they were concerned because they didn't know what are we going to write about her in her obituary? Because she's completely unremarkable. She's not done anything of note. But why is she a doctor of the church? Well, I think it was Pope Paul VI when she was canonized. Well, she was canonized. Pope Paul VI, I think later on, said that she rediscovered the heart of the gospel. That this girl, this French girl, who again entered into the convent when she was 15, died when she was 24, she rediscovered the heart, the very heart of the gospel. Think about this, like, well, so what is that? At the time St. Therese was growing up, there were a couple things happening. There, there was the, the, the devastation of the French Revolution, right? Where these people, this mob rose up and basically said, we're gonna tear down the, what's the establishment. We're gonna tear down um, anything, everything from the royalty. We're gonna tear down also the hierarchy of the church. And not only are they gonna tear down the hierarchy, they're also gonna, going to make it very, very difficult if you're simply a nun or if you're a priest. And so there's this anti-religious movement that was happening, that had happened and had been growing around, you know, for, for in France, in Europe for a while. That was really, really strong this rise of this atheism, and not just atheism, but an anti-religion atheism, an anti-Catholic atheism. On the other hand, you had the second most successful heresy of all time that was raging, raging, raging throughout um, Europe. It's the heresy of Jansenism. And so what's Jansenism? A very, very brief description of Jansenism is this. When it comes down to um, what does God want for you, um, harder equals holier. That's if you want to kind of sum up Jansenism really, really simply, harder means holier. If it's more difficult, that's probably what God wants you to do. If it's the thing that you do not want to do and you'd never do as long as you would live, that's probably what God wants you to, to do. And so harder equals holier. And so there is this, this strain, if you were to take anti-religion, right, this, this anti-Christian, anti-Catholic um, strain of atheism, but if you're faithful, it seemed like the only option, the option that seemed to make the most sense, the option that seemed, I mean, think about this. Why, why do I say it seemed to make the most sense? Because if you read the stories of saints, what you read stories of are people who are doing heroic things. They're doing heroic fasts. They're, they're, they're doing these heroic penances. They're doing these, all, the, all of these heroic acts. And you think, well, shoot, it seems like harder equals holier. If you're gonna do the heroic acts, you better do these in a big, big way. So Jansenism, kind of took, took root in people who were taking God seriously. And yet, as you would imagine, it's completely deprived of joy. It completely deprives the Christian life of the love and the fullness that Jesus said he wanted us to have. He said he wanted us to have fullness, or sorry, joy in our hearts, that our joy would be complete. He also came that we might have life and have life to the full. And yet Jansenism would say, yeah, you can't trust any of those things that bring you joy. Harder equals holier. If you want to do it, say no to it out of love for God. But you always have to say no to it out of love for God. You know, there's a place for penances in our lives. In fact, every one of us should bring penances into our lives at least on Fridays, if nothing else. But that also, there's room for pleasure in our lives. Like God made a world that's good. God made a world that is full of uh, joys, that's full of so many good things. So life isn't just about penance, and even the Christian life is not just about penance. But according to Jansenism, harder equals holier. So here is Therese. She's caught between these two worlds of this anti-religious atheism and this Jansenism that says harder equals holier. And what does she do? Well, she looks at herself and she says, 
I am so small. I am so weak. I mean, honestly, you go into the convent at 15 years old, you try to keep up with the big kids. <laughs> like you try to keep up with these other nuns who are not only stronger, they're also more mature. They have this, the, all these things going for them. Therese saw all of her weaknesses on full display in the face of all these other women who were like legitimately living holy lives. Not Jansenist lives, but holy lives. And she was tempted to this one thing. She was tempted towards discouragement, which I think is fascinating. Let me sidebar on this one because that's actually kind of the point I wanted to talk about when it came to Therese. When pursuing the Lord or letting him pursue us, when we're saying yes to the Lord, it is so easy to look at other people and fall into the, the trap of comparison. It's so easy to look at ourselves and find all of our weaknesses and our sins and our failings and fall into the trap of discouragement. So Therese, when she was 11 years old, at her first Holy Communion, she made three resolutions. One of those resolutions, when she was 11 years old, was she resolved to never allow herself to give in to discouragement. To never allow herself to give in to the temptation towards discouragement. And I think that's crazy. I remember when I was my first Holy Communion and I was not I did not have the wherewithal. I did not have the self-knowledge to know that, oh, you know what I'm going to resolve to do? Um, anything. I, didn't, I was just excited to receive Jesus in the Eucharist. I didn't even know that it would whole long another story. But for Therese to be so aware of herself and aware of her, her potential woundedness that she made this resolution, resolved to never give in to the temptation towards discouragement is phenomenal. And I think it's what's, many, out of many things, is what saved her. Because realizing her weakness, she realized, okay, no, I know God is real, so I'm not going to fall into the atheist camp, even though later on in her life, in her early 20s, uh, she, was, she was tempted in many ways. She was assailed by, by difficulties and assailed by doubts. But on the other hand, she realized that's not the way. The, the Jansenist way is not the way. Harder is not necessarily holier. And especially, especially knowing herself, she's like, I can't even, if it was the way, I couldn't do it. So what do I do? Knowing myself and knowing my weakness knowing that I can never give in to discouragement, I'm going to do what? I'm going to lean into the love of God. I'm going to trust in the love of God. My brothers and sisters, my friends, here's one of the things that when we take God seriously, some of the things, one of the, the thing we, I think we sometimes take least seriously or we take seriously last is His love. Because we know ourselves. We know that we need to be reformed, right? We know we need to repent from sin. We know we need to, to, uh, to, to change. We need to take God seriously. But so often, in the process of that, we fail to take God's love seriously. We, say, we fail to take it seriously that God knows your weakness. He knows my weakness. And He still loves you. He still loves me. That God knows your weakness. He knows my weakness. And He still wants us to be great saints. God wants you to be a great saint. You say, but I keep falling. Okay. God knows that already. So don't get discouraged. Yeah, but I keep struggling. God knows that already. So don't get discouraged. Yeah, but it's sometimes so hard and I can't do the hard thing. Okay, sometimes that's true. Don't get discouraged. Rediscovery of the love of God was what Pope, Pope Paul VI, I think it was him, who said about St. Therese. She rediscovered the heart of the gospel, which is God's love for you. My brothers and sisters, God loves you so much that there is no room for discouragement. God loves you so much that there's no room for this anti-religious atheism. And there's also no room for like, I'm going to do it on my own and I'm going to do harder is holier. God loves you so much that maybe the hardest thing he's going to ever ask you to do is trust in his love for you. Now, obviously, if we love God back, what he's, Jesus said is, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's real. That's true. But today, in the face of whatever kind of discouragement you might experience, in the face of whatever kind of battles you may experience, in the face of whatever kind of, whatever kind of, of, of failing or falling or sinning you may experience, lean into the rediscovery of the heart of the gospel. Lean into the love of God for you. Trust in it. And don't wait. Sometimes it's the thing we least trust in and sometimes it's the thing we last learn. But today, trust in the love of God for you. That's what I got. From all of us here at Ascension Presents, my name is Father Mike. God bless.